Insightful podcasts by informative hosts. Insights into things. A podcast network. Welcome to Insights into Teens, a podcast series exploring the issues and challenges of today's youth. Your hosts are Joseph and Madison Whalen, a father and daughter team making their way through the challenges of the teenage years. Welcome to Insights into Teens. This is episode 138. The Great Debates, Controversial Topics, Part 2. I'm your host, Joseph Whalen, and my calm and centered co-host, Madison Whalen. Hi, everyone. How are you doing today, Maddie? I'm doing as all right as I can be. That doesn't sound particularly <laughs> good the way you put it. Mm. Everything okay? Eh, I've been feeling off. This week, but, you know, I'm starting to get it a bit better. A little bit of a funk? Kind of, yeah. Yeah, we all get that way. It's unavoidable sometimes. This time, you know, with, with COVID and all that stuff going on, it's kind of even more relevant, I guess. But even under ideal circumstances, we all get into a funk eventually. Yeah. Doing okay other than that, though? Yeah, so far. How was your week this week? Um... It's been going all right, despite, you know, the funk, but, um, yeah, so far things have been going all right and with school and everything, so, yeah. Okay. So, last week, we kind of started down the great debates path with some controversial topics. Um, I think it went well. I think it was a very interesting discussion. It was a very good discussion we had last week. Uh, so, what we did was we, we took each of our... Typical three segments. We broke it down into different categories, and we asked some questions. So this week, we're going to continue our little debate on some of those controversial topics. Uh, last week, in the interest of time, we only got through a few questions in each category. I didn't want to monopolize the entire discussion on one category. So this week, we are going to pick up where we left off and see if we can get through the remaining questions. All righty. Before we do that, though... I would invite our listening and viewing audience to subscribe to the podcast. You can find audio versions of this podcast listed as Insights into Teens. Video versions of the podcast and all the network's podcasts can be found listed as Insights into Things. We can be found on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google, Stitcher, iHeartRadio, TuneIn, wherever you can find a podcast. Uh, I would also invite you to write into us, give us your feedback, tell us how we're doing, give us your topics, uh, suggestions for topics for the show. You can email us at comments at insightsintothings.com. We're on Twitter at twitter.com slash insights underscore things. On Facebook, we're at facebook.com slash insights into things podcast. On Instagram, we're at instagram.com slash insights into things or you can get links to all those and much more on our official website at insightsintothings.com. Shall we get into it? Yes, we shall. Here we go. So the first category that we had, and we're going to go down the same category list that we did last week. First category is going to be education. Now, I've paired these categories all down to two questions. Uh, per category, which is what we went through last week, so we should be good on time. The first question, and this is one that we kind of ran into a bit of a, a debate at your school this year, should cell phones be banned in schools? Okay, so I think people kind of just need to meet it halfway. Like... I agree that we shouldn't be allowed to have cell phones during class. It's just a distraction, and using our cell phones, we shouldn't be doing that in class. But completely banning them, I don't think 
is what we should be doing. Like, during lunch I've, and, like, certain free periods, I think they should be allowed to be on their phones because I do think that, like, while a lot of people definitely don't like cell phones, I think when used in proper circumstances and in proper ways, it can help teens. And also, you never know when they're going to need their phones. They are going to need them at some point, like, if there's an emergency. Um, for example, like, I'm not going to cut... Basically, so, with my school, we originally had it where cell phones were banned um, at the beginning of the year. No cell phones whatsoever. Um, and basically, if there was any need to call home, you would, like, just go down the guidance and get them to call your parents. But if there's, like, an emergency where you can't go down the guidance and, like, you really need to get in contact with someone... You're kind of gonna need your phone for that. And, and like, that that can be... There, there are, like, extreme examples of that, but, like, there are also some things that, like, you might need to use your phone in school. Like, um, a specific example I had was that I had to get to my Gmail account uh, for my one class, and I couldn't do that unless, like, I confirmed it on my phone. I wasn't allowed to have my phone, so I couldn't do that. And ironically, the very next day, they announced that we were allowed to have our phones. So, yeah, yeah, that was kind of ironic. But needless to say, there are certain uses that um, that uh, phones are used for in school. And it's also kind of just a way for the kids to just wind down after, you know, stressing. And I know that, like, my school did it because they wanted the kids to talk to other people. And, like, that's good, but... I feel some kids are better just using their phones to de-stress, but, like, not during class. And I I kind of agree with you, probably for different reasons. As a parent in a <clears throat> society where we have so many <clears> – <throat> I'm going to go dark here and say so many school shootings. Um, you never know when it's going to happen to you. Um, whether it's that, whether it's some kind of lockdown, we've had situations in our area here <clears throat> where we've had um, police actions in the area here. They've been chasing criminals and stuff like that, and the schools wind up going into lockdown sometimes. So it's not always you know an active shooter situation. But as a parent, I want my kid to be able to have that tool of communication. And really what it boils down to is discipline. Your kids have to be disciplined in how they use their devices. Yeah. No matter how you cut it, a cell phone is a privilege. And and it's up to the parents to teach the kids how to behave properly with that privilege. Yeah. You know, if you are texting friends or playing on social media or playing video games, whatever it is, there's a time and place for it. Mm -hmm. I'm going to sound like my dad here when I say, you know, get off the phone, you know. But there are times in school that you have that free time to do that stuff with. And I think the concern that I had about your school was that kids were using these at inappropriate times and not getting disciplined for it. And if you're going to impose a rule but not follow up, follow through with it with, with monitoring and disciplinary action then there's no point in having the rule. Yeah. Uh, So I think there is a purpose, there is a utility for having them in schools, whether it's for entertainment value or de-stressing or or whatever. There's a purpose to having them there, just like there's a purpose to having, having them at my work. You know, I'm one of the few people at my work that can carry them onto our manufacturing floor because of my position with the company. But even people that are on the manufacturing floor who can't have their phones on the floor have them at lunch. And they can communicate with their family. They can watch videos. Do do whatever they want with them on their own time. And I think the same situation applies to school. So I think I agree with you 100% there that they should be allowed, but they should be allowed in a controlled manner. Yeah. So the next thing that we have... Uh, and the last one in this category is, and you've never experienced this, but your brother did. Hmm. Should students have to wear uniforms in school? Okay, so 
I feel that there's pros and cons to uniforms. Like, like, I feel a lot of people think, like, oh, the kids don't really have to think about what they're gonna wear, like, everyone looks the same, you know, something like that. And, like, I could definitely see the benefits to it, but I feel that in proper ways, kids should be allowed to express themselves, and one large way is through clothing. And while, yes, and a lot of negative stuff can come from clothing, like inappropriate clothing and, you know, like, oh, you're not wearing expensive clothing, so you're, like, your your worth is basically determined by that. Like, I get, like, the negatives, and uniforms can probably solve that, but I think it's just partly due... I feel like it's just, like... Again, in proper ways, kids should kind of be allowed to express themselves. Like, uh, I feel like kids should just... Clothing is a way to express themselves, and teens kind of need an outlet for them to express themselves. And again, putting restrictions on your clothing is, I definitely think, should be happening so that nothing inappropriate is worn or anything. But I don't think that just telling kids to wear a certain outfit or requiring it should really be um, something that should happen. Um, Because, again, it's kind of just about the individuality and expressing themselves and stuff like that. Here I think I want to disagree a little bit with you. Okay. Like I understand the need for for kids to express their individuality. It's it's part of – Growing up, it's part of that development process. As a kid who came from a uh, poor family, you know, we we did not have, you know, we lived paycheck to paycheck because my dad didn't make a lot of money. My mom didn't work. And every year when we had to buy school clothes, it was a struggle. You know, it was a struggle having the getting the funds to buy them and and getting the sufficient amount of clothes. And as a result, the clothes that I wore were not name brand clothes typically. And uh, going to school in something that was not a name brand designer clothing, you know, I mean, I'm talking jeans, you know, no one was wearing, you know, cardigans or anything like that. But like I couldn't even afford a name brand, like a, a Lee jean or a Wrangler jean or something like that. It was a, it was an off brand jean and it causes stigmatism. You know, you're, you're stigmatized because of that. And kids look at you differently as, as a result of that. And uniforms negate that right off the bat. Well, yeah. Um, the other thing is you don't have to worry about kids wearing inappropriate clothes. You don't have to worry about the controversy of a dress code. Um, you don't have to worry about, Parents don't have to worry about going out and buying the latest and greatest expensive clothing because everyone wears the same thing. Um, And usually the the uniform is usually a shirt, shoes, uh, pants, and and a sweater, I think, or a jacket or something. And a lot of times that stuff can be used year after year. You can even – there's even situations where you can rent that uniform and not have to go out and, and pay for it or you can get it at discounted costs and stuff so it's not a status symbol anymore it's not a disciplinary thing anymore because everybody's wearing the same thing and it, it is a way of stifling your individuality and i could see certainly see that as being one of the detriments to it how would you feel if you had to wear a uniform in school <clears throat> um i Personally, probably wouldn't, like, despite the fact I probably wouldn't be allowed to wear a hoodie, which... That's usually not in the uniform code, no. Yeah, which would be, like, the only real, like, downfall for me. Um, I guess I wouldn't be all that upset with it, because I normally just wear, uh, pants and a shirt in general, although, like... The shoes and, like, the fact I couldn't wear a hoodie might be the only problems I have because I don't know how comfortable the shoes would be, and I kind of like a certain type of shoe now. Um, and, uh, yeah, not wear- being able to wear a hoodie would kind of not really be nice because I prefer hoodies over, like, 
sweaters, I guess. So Well, and that's one of the other problems, one of the other detriments to uniforms is I've yet to see a school uniform that's actually comfortable, mm. you know. And a lot of times, <clears throat> at least in uh, – so Sam went to Catholic school uh, early on in his, his school career. And uh, they – the boys wore pants and the girls wore dresses. And if you don't like wearing a dress, you're kind of beat at that point in time if that's what the dress code is. So it was kind of one of those, it's a non go like they didn't give you options. Like if they gave you options, it'd be one thing. You could wear one of three different styles, but you don't get that. Everyone is expected to stick to the one style. Yeah. So, all right. So we're kind of a push on that one. Yeah. So you'd be okay with it if you had to, but it's, it's not preferred. Yeah. So the next one we have is, uh, next category we have is our personal decisions. So the first question we have here is, is it okay for teens to keep secrets from their parents? Okay. And if that's a secret, you don't have to tell me. (laughs) Goodness. Okay, so I definitely agree that there are certain things teens shouldn't keep uh, secrets about. Like some really depressing thoughts about like harming themselves, harming others or stuff like that. Then I like, that's definitely something I feel that needs to be addressed no matter what. And yes, um, if you keep very harmful secrets, like if you're smoking or doing drugs or something like that, or doing risky behavior, yeah, keeping that a secret from your parents is not really something that should be, be happening but i do think that parents kind of need to respect some teens privacy like there are certain things teens are like would be okay for teens to keep from their parents like some like if they don't feel comfortable talking to their parents about certain mental health things going on but they feel comfortable talking to someone else then it's kind of okay to not really mention it to your parents and really just kind of talk with the person that you feel more comfortable with Or if it's just, like, little harmless secrets, like certain hobbies you don't want your parents, you don't really want to tell your parents about, or just, like, little special tidbits you kind of keep to yourself. I definitely think that, like, parents really need to stop being so overprotective. Like, certain parents need to be a little less overprotective of their teens, because, like, I know that a big thing is that, like, some parents don't even allow their kids to have a door to their room, which, okay, that is kind of extreme. Like, you're not even allowing your kids that privacy. Um, so, I know secrets not all, aren't always, like, a privacy thing, but I definitely think privacy is a big impact, has a big impact when it comes to secrets. Um, so, while I definitely think there are certain things that shouldn't be kept from your parents that you need to let them know so that they can help you or so you can stop doing these, be- like, really bad and harmful behaviors... I still think that some parents need to respect their teens' privacy with a little less harmful things or just things they don't feel comfortable telling their parents about. Okay. I think that's fair. Uh, I think think parents probably need to have as open a dialogue with their kids as possible uh, because there are a lot of difficult topics that you need to discuss with your kids that if your kids aren't comfortable talking to you, you're never going to be able to communicate and communicating with your kids is vital in order to ensure that they're taken care of and they, you know, grow up to be decent human beings. Uh, I also understand the fact that you need to have your own space. You need to have your own privacy. Uh, So I don't, as a parent, I wouldn't expect you to, uh, be forthcoming with, with everything that you weren't comfortable with. But also as a parent, it's our job to make sure that if there are issues, that, that those issues are not harmful to you. So anytime, you know, mommy or I pry and, and we seem like we're invading your privacy, it's not out of malice. It's for your own good. Yeah. Uh, so it's important to keep that in mind too. Yeah, and kind of parents need to find that 
balance where they're not like completely like a helicopter parent watching over the kids and not even allowing them to have a door to their room. Right. That's definitely the extreme example, but you also don't want to be so careless that your kid can end up harming themselves or others. Absolutely. It as with anything in life, it's a balance. Mm-hmm. So the next one, the last question in this uh, category here is about bad habits or habits, whether they're bad or not, it's interpretable. Mm. Should teens be allowed to vape if they're not allowed to smoke? No. Both are really bad, and I don't feel that vaping is any better than smoking, and I don't think any kid should be doing any of Thing related to either vaping or smoking or anything dealing with that kind of stuff. Okay, well, that settles that then. <laughs> I know that I, I wasn't... <laughs> Moving right along. <laughs> I'm sorry. I wasn't really able to make an entire debate about that, but like... Well, some things aren't debatable. I mean, you feel very strongly about this, and I, I respect that. Yeah, it's just like smoking in general, no real benefits. Vaping's kind of the same thing. Thing. And I've heard about all the negative side effects that come from it, and there's really nothing that makes it better than smoking. And I feel like they're kind of on the same level of don't do this. Well, what's interesting is that, that vaping kind of came out as an alternative way to quit smoking, where you could use what they term as e-cigarettes, and you could put a chemical compound in the cigarette that would vaporize it, and that would help to wing you off of the nicotine addiction of smoking. And then it turned out that people just started using that instead of cigarettes because they thought they were healthier. Yeah. And then people started putting additional chemicals in there. They started putting uh, certain oils in there that had... Uh, narcotic effects and and what they're finding now now that it's been out long enough to do studies on it is that vaping has its own kind of very brutal damage that it does to the lungs depending on what kind of compounds that you're trying to vape some of these things are not meant to be ingested uh, into the lungs they're they're meant like for instance you know CBD oil you know there are there are people that that vape CBD oil to get the THC, not CBD, but it's it's basically oil that has marijuana oil in it. It's THC is the com- chemical compound. And the problem is while they get that euphoric feeling from the drug compound, the solution that it's uh, diluted into is not something that's – it's something that's very harmful to the lungs. And what people are finding is it's causing lung disease in teenagers now because of the fact that you're bas- you're ingesting an oil into your lungs and it's coating the inside of your lungs. Mm-hmm. So I totally agree with you. Vaping, if you were using it under the direction of a doctor to quit smoking, that's one thing. If you're doing either of these things recreationally, it's not a good thing. Yeah. So... That was all we had for these two categories. We're going to take a quick break and we'll come back and we'll talk about public policies and politics. We'll be right back. (laughs) For over seven years, the Second Sith Empire has been the premier community guild in the online game Star Wars The Old Republic. With hundreds of friendly and helpful active members, a weekly schedule of nightly events, annual guild meet and greets, and an active community both on the web and on Discord. The Second Civ Empire is more than your typical gaming group. We're family. Join us on the Star Forge server for nightly events such as operations, flashpoints, world boss hunts, Star Wars trivia, guild lottery, and much more. Visit us on the web today at www.thesecondsithempire.com. (laughs) 
Welcome back to Insights into Teens and our part two of our great debates of controversial topics. And we're going to talk about public policies. <clears throat> so question number one is, is immigration beneficial or harmful for the United States? I guess it can technically be considered as both. Well, one, you're getting more people into the country and I guess diversifying the country more, helping the people and also expanding the population. There can also probably come harms to that with expanding the population, having to get more food out and maybe higher inflation or something. Um, I definitely think like... Just to clarify, well, my perspective on the question here is legal immigration, not uh, illegal immigration. Uh, so should the borders be open for legal immigration for people to come in, refugees, for instance, or people that are just relocating to, to the United States from other countries? Not the really controversial debate about illegals that are crossing the border without being processed correctly from immigration. So that might change oh. your answer there. Okay. Well, people that are legally put immigrated into the United States, I feel like that would still be pretty much beneficial. Um, because, like, one, we're, well, um, yeah, which, I haven't really given it much thought. <laughs> uh, I don't know. I guess I didn't fully... I don't fully understand. Like, I understand what it's asking. It's just... So, all right. let's. It, it's worthwhile to have a discussion about it then. So, this country itself is, is basically built on immigrants. Yeah. You know, everything that we've done here has been, you know, people that have come from other countries. And unfortunately, some of the things we've done to the indigenous people is a result of that. But nowadays, that immigration, there you don't see the, the waves of immigrants coming over from, from Europe to flee famine and, and oppression and stuff like that. The immigrants that you have coming to us now are, you know, they're coming here for work. They're coming here for education like they always have. But you are having a good deal of people coming in as refugees from war-torn countries. Or people that are coming in from countries that have had natural disasters and can't support their people. So what you have is you have a lot of people that are coming into the country now who aren't, may, may not be able to support themselves. Okay, so that's one thing. You have people that might not be coming in who are educated and ready to come in to take important high paying jobs. You have people that are coming in a lot of times with absolutely nothing. They, they, they had to leave everything behind. You know, we look at the people that, um, escaped the, uh, the Taliban in Afghanistan. And a lot of those people had to find homes and a lot of different countries took them in the United States being one of them. But when they arrived here, they had almost nothing. They didn't have jobs. They didn't have homes. They didn't have people. They didn't. A lot of times, they didn't have family that they could they could depend on. And as a result, the government has to take care of them. So there's a certain uh, I don't want to say burden, but I think burden's a little too rough. But there's a there's a certain cost to bringing in immigrants like that. That some people look at it as an immediate detriment to the country because of that. Whereas other people look at that as a solid investment. We're going to save these people. We're going to do the right thing. We're going to do the humanitarian thing. We're going to bring them into the country. We're going to help them get back on their feet. And then when they get back on their feet, they're going to be productive citizens in the, in the country here. And it's eventually going to pay off in the end. You have the fear that when you do stuff like this and you bring mass immigrants in for refugee purposes – that you're letting terrorists into the, into the country as well. So those are some of the things to consider when you consider what you think. Do you think it's beneficial or harmful to the United States? 
With knowing all that now, what's your stance on it? Well, knowing all that now, uh, my stance would be... I'm still on, like, the humanitarian side. Like, yes, it would be... It, we need... We should be helping these people. But I can also understand the financial aspect of the fact that a lot of them, we can't really support themselves, thus the government has to support them. And thus, the cost of taking care of them is pretty high. But, again, I do feel as though once we help them, they will um, become productive citizens. And I just feel it's the right thing to do, and it's kind of, in a way, worth the cost. And, and I think I'm on the same page with you. I think as long as there's a certain burden that decent people have to take on in order to do the right thing. And that, that comes from everyday stuff from day to day up to the, the big let's save a country full of people from tyrants. And we always have to make these decisions to do the right thing. And sometimes the right thing can, can hurt and sometimes the right thing can cost. And I think in situations like this, where you have a mass exodus of people from a certain region or certain country, good people have to stand up and do the right thing. And sometimes that's just one country that does that. A lot of times that's the United States that does that. In this situation here, specifically to speaking to Afghanistan, a lot of countries stepped up. And as long as society in general not just the United States, but society in general, the world over. As long as good, decent people stand up and shoulder that burden and share that burden together, I think it's manageable. And I think what it does is it promotes a more enlightened approach, you know, to, to countries so that you don't have tyrannical regimes out there. Mm -hmm. You know, if, if, if the good people aren't going to support those who stand up to tyrants, then you're going to see tyrants everywhere. Yeah. And tyrants need to be stood up to. Yeah. So if we're not going to go in, and I'm not advocating that we go in and fight these wars for the people that are, that are in these tyrannical regimes, but if we're not willing to at least do our part to support them and, and to shelter them and provide them care, then we're just as bad as the tyrants are, really. Yeah. So, so I'm with you on that one. So the next one is another really topical controversial thing, and that has to do with police brutality. So you've seen a lot of stuff in the news lately about uh, police and Black Lives Matter and, and police um, shooting and, and violently uh, attacking uh, minorities. Um, and there's a lot of laws in place that protect police from being prosecuted in situations like this. Uh, you had the George Floyd case where a police officer knelt on his neck and he wound up suffocating and dying as a result of that. So the question here is, should police officers be charged with excessive force in cases of brutality like that? Do you think they should be held accountable in a court of law? I mean, yeah, it's like... Yeah, they should definitely be held with excessive force because, <clears throat> especially if you kill the person and you didn't even give them a chance to defend themselves in court, yeah, I definitely think they should be charged with excessive force. So now it's worth noting that, that not every case is cut and dry like that. Well, so yeah. there, are, there are cases where uh, use of force is required, okay? So there are certain protocols, certain uh, rules that police officers have to follow for even drawing their gun, let alone firing it or hitting anybody. So they, as long as they work through those rules and, and they stick to the rule book, they're usually not prosecuted. But in situations where someone stole a car, it's a completely theoretical situation. Someone steals a car. And they're racing away from the police. And the police get in the car and they chase him. And they chase him and he crashes the car and he runs away. And while he's running away, the police shoot him. Is that justifiable? 
Probably not, no. Right. If he turns around with a weapon, doesn't fire it, but he aims it at the police, is it justifiable? Then it gets a little grayer. Yeah. If he fires the weapon, but he doesn't hit a police officer, but he's firing indiscriminately in a public location, is that justified? If he fires and he hits a police officer, is it justified to shoot him at that point? Mm. So these are kind of the things that you, you have to take into account because there's that's one scenario where you've got four levels of escalation right there. Yeah. Um, and I think really any time that there's a situation where there's threat of bodily harm to the police or to, to someone else, you can justify a, a more um, energetic response, we'll say. Yeah. Um, but at that point in time, can they be held accountable? Well, I guess if, like, something does threaten the safety, I guess using they don't really, like, especially if someone could have been endangered, yeah, they probably don't have to be accused for that. But if no one was being harmed and they were just running away, then it's kind of excessive. Okay. that's. I think that's a very clear distinction. So let's move on to something that's not nearly as controversial. Politics. So, should the government be responsible for guaranteeing the protection of your privacy? And now, let me preface this by saying, when we talk about privacy... We're talking about all kinds of privacy. So you have you have people that invade your privacy at home looking at your windows. You have digital privacy with people that are snooping on you and, and following you online. You have public privacy where you may be out of the mall and some creepy guy's following you around. So we're, when I talk policy, uh, uh, privacy, I'm talking about the grand scheme of privacy on all levels. Should the government be responsible for protecting that? I feel on certain levels is when the government should be uh, protecting people's privacy. Like with the whole public scenario, yes, the government should, um, especially in public places, they should help respect people's privacy but in other more tighter scenarios it gets a little uh like okay maybe you don't need to really you shouldn't involve yourself i guess okay uh so it's selective it should be applied selectively it shouldn't be a one rule fits everything scenario yeah kind of like with police brutality okay i could see that so the last question we have on politics is one that's not all that relevant now, but it's something that creeps up in society periodically. And that is, should military service be mandatory for all citizens? Now, I ask this because in the past we've had a draft during times of war uh, and times of police action, I guess I should say, where you have to register. Everyone, when you turn 18, has to register for the draft. I think I think everyone does now. I don't even know. That's been so long for me, I don't remember. I know I did. And that makes you eligible to be called up for a draft during time of war under certain circumstances. But we have countries like the Soviet Union, when the Soviet Union was around. And there's a lot of other ones. But when you reached a certain age, you were required to join the military for a certain number of years. And that was how they kept their military numbers up. Should that be the case in the United States where in order as a as a product of being a citizen and the rights that you're granted from that, should you have to spend I don't know, two years in the military? Um mm. Whew, okay. Um Mm. Yeah, you're going to have to give me more than grunts and sighs. <laughs> yeah. Uh, this is definitely an interesting one. Um, How would you feel if the government said you had to join the military when you got out of high school? 
I wouldn't really be too happy because one, I'm still kind of young, and two, I really wouldn't know what to where to start, and three, it kind of scares me. Okay, so then go on that. How how do you now feel about the government imposing that on people? I mean, like imposing it immediately after you're done with high school definitely shouldn't be something that should be happening. I feel because a lot of high schoolers don't like. They're still kind of kids. Like, they might, like, be close to being adults, but, like... Well, being in the military can make you grow up real fast, from what I understand. Eh, yeah. So you're not in favor of it? Not really. Okay. And and I can't say I blame you. I don't relish the idea of you having to go into the military as soon as you get out of high school, either. There's a lot of benefits to the military. I'm certainly not knocking the military, so don't send me any hate mail. Yeah. Um, the military has done wonderful things for a lot of people. I have a lot of friends of mine are former military. Um, I had actually uh, looked at joining uh, when I was in high school. Uh, unfortunately, for health reasons, I just I was disqualified. But I think. There's definitely benefits to it um, from a growth standpoint, but also from a financial standpoint. The government does tend to take care of its its soldiers. So it's not necessarily a bad thing, but it's not for everyone. And I think a voluntary military force is probably the best way to go at this point in time. Yeah. Especially during peacetime. Mm-hmm. Uh, so that was all we had for our questions this segment. When we come back, we have religion, we have relationships, and we never did any of the medical ones. I don't know if we'll get to those today, but we'll see how far we uh, get and what our time looks like when we when we come back. We'll be right back. Insights into Entertainment, a podcast series taking a deeper look into entertainment and media. Our husband and wife team of pop culture fanatics are exploring all things from music and movies to television and fandom. We'll look at the interesting and obscure entertainment news of the week. We'll talk about theme park and pop culture news. We'll give you the latest and greatest on pop culture conventions. We'll give you a deep dive into Disney, Star Wars, and much more. Check out our video episodes at youtube.com backslash insights into things. Our audio episodes at podcast.insightsintoentertainment.com or check us out on the web at insightsintothings.com. Welcome back to Insights into Teens. We are debating some controversial topics and we're talking religion now. So, question number one, are Muslims discriminated the most compared to other religious groups in today's society? I don't really know. I don't really know technically who would be discriminated against the most. Muslims are definitely discriminated against a lot in modern society. But, and again, a lot of other religious groups kind of have that similar discrimination kind of like we mentioned well you kind of had mentioned last week um there's still a lot of religious conflict going on between varying religions and i definitely think that we're there's still a lot of discrimination going on not just with muslims but with a lot of um religious groups and i don't really I don't know if there's, like, one that's being discriminated against the most. Um, It's kind of just, like, they're all being discriminated against, and I feel we need to put, like, there are probably ones that we should probably put more effort into discriminating against less. Um, But, basically, we're trying to eliminate discrimination of religion in general, so... (coughs) So everyone gets discriminated against and we should just stop discriminating against everybody. Or at least put efforts to. Okay. I I can't argue with that. I mean, that's good logic. 
So religion is interesting. Over the course of its history, religion has really been used as a control mechanism, at least in my opinion. It gives people focus and hope and guidance and all that stuff too. But for the most part, people have used religion and God in whatever form you, you refer to him in to control people. You know, if you do bad things, you're going to go to hell. You know, that's that's really what religion's been used for and to get people to do things. You know, if, if you're faithful, you'll go do this in the name of your God. So a lot of times religion is used to control the population and keep the population in check with the promise of otherworldly rewards or punishments. Things that normal secular society can't provide. Secular societies, you do something wrong, you're going to go to jail. You do something wrong, you'll be executed. And religion is used to say, okay, well, when you do something wrong and you die, you'll be tortured for eternity by the devil or whatever. And I'm oversimplifying it, of course. Yeah. So my question to you is, if that's what religion's been used for for centuries, can you be good without God? Can you be good without religion? Or do you do, does society need religious guidance in order to be a civilized society? I actually think we'd kind of be a little better without it. Again, I'm not, like, thinking about it in that context... I don't think anyone really needs to believe in a religion entirely. Like, while there are, can be benefits to it, there's also somewhat detriments and discrimination when it comes to it, and there's a lot of negatives that seem to be revolving around religion. And I feel that if you don't really want to be incredibly religious, you can live a fine life without it. Okay. Um, I, I'm not going to argue with you. I feel the same exact way. Hmm. I think if you're a decent person, you're a decent person. It doesn't matter what your religion is. Yeah. Okay, that's it for religion. I think we've we've exhausted that one. Mm -hmm. Relationships. This is always a fun one. <laughs> yeah. So this one's kind of a one track, two questions here. Should same sex marriages be legal? Yes, I think they should. I think that if you two feel okay with each other and you both love each other, you should be allowed to marry. It doesn't really matter what your gender is or what your sex is or something like that. Okay. Well, that was that was kind of anticlimactic. <laughs> what do you mean? I was expecting to have a, a discussion about that, but I, I agree with you. I don't think the state or the government or your religious order or whatever it is should tell you who you can and can't love. Yeah. And I think... You know, nowadays marriage, ironically enough, it's it's traditional marriages that have devalued the institution of marriage over the last 50 years or so. Yeah, like you always have the whole thing like, oh, my wife's always yelling at me. And you have like the boomer meme, like the like baby boomer memes of, oh, we have a horrible relationship. And it's like. Yeah, people are finally starting to realize that, yeah, that's not really good. Well, you just look at the statistics on divorce and you realize that your divorce rate's above 50% right now for heterosexual marriage. And it's like, okay, well, if the institution of marriage is a 50-50 shot, who are you to say that a same-sex couple shouldn't be married at that point? Yeah. Okay, well, and the last question that we have, because we're not going to do the medical ones today, we'll save those for a different podcast. This one is, should LGBTQ folks be allowed to adopt children? I mean, yeah, I feel like anyone who has the ability and the care and want to have and take care of their own child and can't, for whatever reason have their own, yeah, I feel like anyone should be allowed to adopt children as long as, you know, they're going to provide them a good life and they're going to care for them. Okay. I guess that sums it up there, doesn't it? Uh, 
But I agree. As long as you're a loving, you know, you bring that child into a loving home and you can care for the child and you can attend to the child's needs and raise that child to be a decent human being, I don't think it matters what kind of relationship you happen to be in or even if you're in a relationship. Yeah. You know, being a single parent is difficult, but there are a lot of single parents out there that are absolutely outstanding. So, okay. Uh, I, I kind of thought these were going to be more detailed topics, but I think we, we kind of are on the same subject with them. I mean, we can try to make it a little more detailed if you want. No, I don't want to, I don't want to, you know, force the subject itself. Maybe we can, you know what, let's, we've got, we've got time left. Let's go on to some of the medical questions since those were so fast. Alrighty. This is a great one. This is, this is about as controversial as I think we've had so far. Yeah. Should vaccinations against COVID-19 be mandatory? Oh boy. Um. Yeah. Kind of, yeah. I kind of feel like. In certain cases, especially considering it's been a pandemic, yeah, it should kind of be mandatory. Like, again, if it's a health problem or you, mm, I don't know if I want to, I don't know how to phrase the next part. Like, if it's a health problem, find out, just be safe about it. I don't know how to, like, I guess if your belief system, hmm. Mm. If you, They're controversial <laughs> topics, so you can say it as long as you say it cleanly. If your belief system doesn't is like against vaccination, I guess you are it. Uh, uh, I feel it needs to be required. Like it needs to be required to the pe to most people. Like the people who don't, there pe like there are different people who don't believe in it versus like people who just don't believe in it well, due to their religion. All right, so hang on a second. Let's let me stop you right there. When you say don't believe in it, don't believe in what? It, that vaccinations are against their religion? Like that. They don't believe in the science? Like, what do you mean? More the religion, I probably, that's probably the best way I can clarify Okay, it. so there are religions out there that don't think you should be using modern medicine, that it should be a faith-based healing type scenario. And I'm not one to tell someone else how to have their own beliefs, but the problem that I have with situations like that is you have a lot of people that are trying to claim religious exemptions for that, but they've had other vaccinations or they've had other medicines from modern medicine. And it's like, well, you, you can't have both. Mm. You know, if you want to live out in the country and you want to use... Uh, natural herbs and remedies and stuff like that to keep yourself healthy, more power to you. If you've taken any over-the-counter medicine or any prescription medication at any point in time in your life and you're going to come to me and tell me that you don't believe in vaccines because it's against your religion, you don't have a leg to stand on. Okay, yeah. So it really kind of just depends on who you talk about. But the people that don't believe in the science, yeah, they should just get it just... Make it mandatory for yeah. them. And I'm with you 100%. You know, when when there is statistical evidence to say that vaccines have a clinical effect on reducing the spread and people that I respect that I've known for years are going to come to me and say, I don't believe, I don't, I choose not to believe that. You know, I had a discussion with someone who's a colleague of mine some time back and the claim that he made was, well, everyone's saying that uh, COVID's killing all these people. Well, it's not people. It's, it's people that already had pre-existing conditions. Ah, that person. And I made the point that I have a pre-existing condition. I have diabetes. And with medication and diet and exercise, my diabetes is under control. If I were to get COVID and die from a diabetic complication, it wouldn't be because I had diabetes because it's under control normally. It would be because I had COVID. And he looked me in the face and he said, well, I don't, I just don't believe that. Like he literally just chose not to believe facts. 
And at that point in time, I, I'm thinking, well, I can't have a conversation with you about this anymore because I, I can't apply logic. I, I don't know how to talk to nonsense. Uh, and it's people like that that when you make vaccines mandatory, they're going to resist it until the end of time. Um, so I personally don't think vaccines should be mandatory. Okay. I think vaccines should be voluntary. Because telling anybody that they have to put a chemical in their body, and that goes with all vaccines. I think the vaccines that you have to take for school, because you have to take certain vaccinations at certain intervals in order to attend public school. I think they should be voluntary. I think there should be consequences if you don't. I mean, we obviously believe in, in the science enough that you had those vaccinations. If you didn't have those vaccinations, I think the school system would be perfectly within its rights to say that we can't send you to school. Then it would be incumbent upon us to find an alternative way to educate you that doesn't require those vaccinations. So I don't think they should be mandatory. They're mandatory to attend the school. And I'm okay with that because it's their school. They can make their rules. That's why I don't think mandatory vaccines is a good idea for the public in general. Okay. Um, all right. One, one last question, and uh, we'll call it a day. And I might, this might require some definition. You know what euthanasia is? Yeah, I actually looked it up for this. Okay, good. Should euthanasia be legalized for humans? Basically, should assisted suicide be legal for humans? <sighs> okay. Well, for one, it definitely should not be for, like, regular people. No, no, and this is, we're talking about people that are terminally ill. Um, you know, for instance, I think of my father when it comes to this. My father had terminal cancer. The day that he was diagnosed with cancer, he knew he wasn't going to survive. There wasn't a treatment that they had that was going to help him because of the type of cancer he had and how far along he had. And he fought it for the sake of you know, the family, despite knowing that he wasn't going to get any better. And there came a point during that treatment where he was miserable. He was absolutely in agony, had no decent quality of life. And we basically had to watch him waste away to nothing and die. And it broke my heart to do that. And I, I talk about my father on, on this podcast a lot. I was not particularly close with my father. But to have to see any human being go through that, knowing that they're suffering and knowing that I can't legally do anything to ease that suffering, it's a very difficult position. That's what we're talking about. People that are terminal, that are suffering, that ending their life is a merciful thing for them because of how much they're suffering. Should that be legal? Yeah. Like, it sounds like... From different perspectives, it can sound worse, but if there's absolutely nothing, no other alternatives, and they're just and they could just waste away, and if the option is there to just have them go peacefully instead of in agony, because no one would want to have someone just die agonizingly, in constant pain, and if you can just at least grant them the ability to die peacefully as opposed to in complete and utter pain, knowing you can't do anything else to save them, yeah, I think it should be legalized for those specific occasions. Okay. And I think we'll leave it at that. That's a very heavy topic uh, to end on, very heavy question to end on. Yeah. Uh, and I certainly don't want to make light of it. Uh, suicide is not something that should be considered under any circumstance really um and you know i don't want to go into too much agonizing detail about that but this is a very special example of what we're talking about here and having lived through that and that decision myself it's one that is is very close to me you know um so i think we'll leave it at that i and i think we've We've managed to tread lightly enough through these controversial topics. 
as best as we could. I think we've done a very good job of covering some of these. And I, and I think maybe we'll do this again sometime in the future when the political climates change and, and society changes a little bit and there's there's more topics, controversial topics for us to debate. But I really enjoy these discussions. Me too. Um, before we go, though, uh, I do want to once again uh, invite you to write in uh, so I'm sorry, I invite you to subscribe to the podcast. You can get uh, audio versions of this podcast listed as Insights into Teens. Video versions can be found listed as Insights into Things on Pandora, Castro, Stitcher, Podbean, Buzzsprout, etc. I would also invite you to uh, check us out, uh, give us your feedback. You can email comments at insightsintothings.com. Uh, we also stream five days a week on Twitch at twitch.tv slash insights into things. You can find audio versions of this podcast on the web at podcast.insightsintoteens.com. Video versions of the podcast can be found on the web at podcast.insightsintothings.com. Where you can find links to all that and much more on our website at insightsintothings.com. And you... And don't forget to check out our other two podcasts, Insights into Entertainment, hosted by you and Mommy, and Insights into Tomorrow, our monthly podcast, hosted by you and my brother, Sam. All right. Hopefully, we'll be back with a lighter topic next week uh, to lighten things up and have a little bit more fun. But that's it. Another one in the books. Bye, everyone. Bye.